Recording by Dale Grothman. Vogel started with crossword puzzles and worked his way up to man's greatest enigma. Felony by James O. Causey. When he was nine, Vogel almost killed another boy who inadvertently scattered his half completed jigsaw puzzle. At sixteen, he discovered the mysteries of the Danish gambit and cried. At twenty two, he crouched in a foxhole on Okinawa, oblivious to the death bursting about him, squinting in a painful ecstasy at the tattered fragment of a newspaper on his knee. His sergeant screamed in agony, then died at his elbow. Vogel's face lit up. Slay, he said happily, scribbling. As crossword puzzles go, it had been a toughie. At thirty, he was production manager of Saks Fixtures. His men hated him. The general manager loved him. Tall, gaunt, and ruthless, he could glance at any detail print and instantly pinpoint the pattern of final assembly, total man-hour budget, and the fabrication lead time. Once, he made a mistake. On a $40,000 job lot, he estimated too high on production scrap. When the final assemblies were completed, they had two feet of bulb extension left over. It disturbed him. He spent that evening in his den brooding over chessmen. His wife left him alone. Personnel called that morning and apologized. No experience, but amazing shop aptitude. He's coming down to you for an interview. I want, Vogel said into the phone, three bench men by noon with shop experience personnel was sorry vogel snarled and hung up hello please sir said a voice vogel stared icily meekness cowered in front of his desk meekness in the form of a small bird-like person with beseeching amber eyes i am emminth he said cringingly Vogel eyed the olive skin, the cheekbones, the blue-black hair. Oh, wetback, he said. Three men short, and they send me wetbacks. You know sheet metal, Buster? I am not of the understanding, Ameth offered. Experience, no, he beamed. Aptitude, yes. Fighting apoplexy, Vogel took him out into the shop. Ameth cringed at the howl of the air tools and punch presses. Vogel contemptuously took him by the arm and led him to a workbench, where a wizened persimmon of a man performed deft lightnings with rivets and air wrench. Benny, this is Ameth. He's new. Vogel pronounced it like a curse. Get him some goggles from the crib and a rivet gun. Vogel returned to his office scowling. The phone rang almost instantly. Boss, said Benny, he is from nothing. All thumbs with an air wrench, and he don't know alclad from stainless. Be right out, Vogel said, hanging up. Before he had a chance to fire Ammon, the fabrication super came in with a production problem. Vogel solved it, but it was almost an hour before he returned to Benny's bench and stared. Ameth was a blur of motion. His keller chattered like a live thing. A furious sweating Benny snapped at Vogel. You playing practical jokes? Look, this guy's gone crazy. He's fifty percent under standard. Tell him to slow down before I file a grievance. Ameth beamed. I am of the aptitude, he said. A queer, deep tingle went through Vogel. The crystal delight of challenge he felt when confronted by an apparently impregnable fianchetto. That was the first day. A week later, Vogel was compiling a progress report from the completed shop travelers. Abruptly, he scowled at one traveler and then said, Charlie! Yes, sir, one of the planters said. Why didn't these galley panels go out for drop hammer? Charlie preened at the form and whistled. Somebody must have changed the planning sheet. 
Get me the story. Charlie went hurriedly out into the shop. Some time later he returned with a pale, dazed look. It's this guy in assembly, he said. Name is Amanth. He didn't even read the traveler. Just looked at the attached detail print and decided to miter the edges, then reverse the flange with a weld. He threw the completed part on Vogel's desk. Go ahead. Check those tolerances, he said whitely. Right on the money. Vogel walked over to a calculator and figured. There was a dreamy expression in his eyes. He said softly, All fabrication in our own shop. A net savings of ninety-three cents per unit, or eight hundred dollars total. I believe you planned this item, Charlie. Vogel fired him. That same afternoon, Amanth came into the office on Vogel's orders. Sir? Don't you know how to read a traveler? Vogel said sternly. It was a lucky accident. Amanth looked terrified. I just read the print and did what seemed logical. Statement, then very quiet question. What happened to your accent? The little man looked blank. Vogel took a slow, deep breath. I've got a material planning job open, he said tightly. Three fifty to start. Interested? For a moment he thought Amanth would lick his hand. The little man took to planning sheets like a duck to water. He poured feverishly over blueprints, turned out travelers in a steady flood. Vogel watched him. He went over to personnel, requested Amanth's employment application, read it, and scowled. It was a masterpiece of anonymity. Birthplace, New York. Former occupation, laborer. Hobbies, none. He memorized Amanth's address and returned the application. Vogel always ate lunch in his office with his expediters. That noon, two of them got into an argument about the planets. I say there's life on Mars, Pete Stone insisted stubbornly. When the polar ice cap melts, the water runs along the canals, and traces of green from growing vegetation can be spotted. Which proves nothing, Harry Lamb yawned. Lamb was chief expediter. Man couldn't live there anyway. There's not enough oxygen. You would be amazed, Emmett said quietly, at the adaptability of man. Vogel set down his thermos and leaned forward. You mean Martians, for instance, could live here, assuming they existed and had spaceships? Emmett's smile was infinitely bitter until they'd go mad. The talk turned to baseball. Vogel lit his pipe and gave Amanth a surreptitious glance. The little man slumped in the corner, bleak and withdrawn. It was delicious. Vogel left the shop and drove across town to Amanth's address. It turned out to be in an ancient rooming house on the west side. Mrs. Reardon, the landlady, was an apathetic woman who brightened when he asked her about Emmett. He moved in just three weeks ago, her face softened in recollection. He was like a lost dog coming in out of the rain. Couldn't hardly speak English, and he wanted me to trust him for the rent. I must have been crazy. Her nostrils flared. Not that he hasn't paid up. Are you a cop? Vogel nodded as he took out his wallet. In it was his honorary sheriff's badge, but he doubted if the woman would know the difference. She didn't. She led the way upstairs to Amanth's room, worrying, and Vogel assured her they were only looking for a hit-and-run witness, that it was strictly routine. Amanth's room was incredibly antiseptic, barren of pictures, ashtrays, dirty laundry, any of the normal masculine debris. Vogel got the stark impression of a convict cell. In the bleak dresser were two pairs of socks, underwear, one tie. In the closet hung one white shirt, period. Everything wore an indefinable patina of newness. 
Two books graced the top of the dresser. Vogel recognized one of them, a text on fabrication and design, which Ameth had borrowed from his office. The other was a child's primer on English. He stays in his room almost every night, reads mostly, and he speaks English much better now, said Mrs. Reardon. A good tenant. I can't complain. He's quiet and clean. She described Ameth, and Vogel shook his head. Our man is about sixty with a beard, he said. Funny coincidence. It's a strange name. Mrs. Reardon agreed. Vogel drove back to the shop whistling. He did not go to his chess club that night, but went to the library instead. He read about flying saucers, about space travel, about the possibility of life on other planets. Sometimes he chuckled. Once he frowned deeply and bit his lip. That night in bed, listening to his wife's shallow breathing, he said, Alice? Yes? Suppose you were lost on a desert island. What would you do? I'd build a raft, she said sleepily. Vogel smiled into the darkness. The next day he made a systematic tour of the stockroom, scanning the racks of completed subassemblies, the gleaming fixture components, the rows of panels, brackets, extrusions, all waiting like soldiers to march from the stockroom into final assembly. Vogel suddenly grunted. There, half hidden behind a row of stainless steel basin assemblies, was a nine-inch bowl. He examined it. The bowl was heavy and shiny. There was no part number stamp, and the metal was not alclad, not stainless, not cad, nor zinc. Five small copper discs had been welded to the lower flange. Vogel carefully scraped off a sample with a file. Then he replaced the part in the stock rack and went into his office where he placed the sample in an envelope. That afternoon he ranged the shop like a hound. In the shipping crib he found a half-completed detail that struck a chord of strangeness. Two twisted copper veins with a crumbled shop traveler signed by Ameth. The next operation specified furnace brays. Vogel squinted at the attached detail print. It was a current job number. He spent the next two hours in the Ozolid room, leafing through the print files. The job number called for a deep freeze showcase, and there were exactly 207 detailed drawings involved. Not one of them matched the print in shipping. After an almost silent dinner at home, he sat smoking his pipe, waiting for the phone to ring. It rang at eight. It's platinum, Carstairs said. Tim Carstairs was the night shift chemist. Anything wrong, Mr. Vogel? No, Vogel paused. Thanks, Tim. He hung up, glancing at his fingers. They were shaking. You, Alice said, look ready to call mate in three. I'm going over to the shop, he said, kissing her. Don't wait up. He was not surprised to see the light on in the parts control section. Ammon was writing planning sheets. I don't believe we authorized overtime, Vogel told him mildly, hanging up his coat. Just loose ends, Ammon's smile was nervous. Tying up those burden charts. I am on my own time. I thought I'd set up next month's budget, Vogel sat at his desk. By the way, what did you do before you came here? Odd jobs, Ameth's lips twitched. Your family live on the coast? Sweat glistened on the little man's forehead. Ah, uh, no, my folks passed on years ago. Cat and Mouse You've done good work lately, Vogel yawned, studying the progress chart on the wall. Behind him he heard a soft exhalation of relief, the furtive rustle of papers, as Ameth cleaned off his desk. When Ameth finally left, Vogel went over to his desk and methodically ransacked the work-in-progress file. It took him two hours to find what he was looking for. 1. A schematic detail on graph paper, which resembled no type of circuit Vogel had ever seen. 
two, fourteen completed shop travelers on which were typed clearly, call Emmeth upon completion. This was not unusual. Most expediters wanted to be notified when the hot part hit the inspection. The unusual part was that no inspection stamp had been placed opposite the final operation of inspected, identified, returned to stock. Ergo, Ameth had inspected and stocked the parts himself. 3. A progress chart with dates, indicating four detailed parts still remaining in a fabrication. Final assembly date, tomorrow. The following afternoon, Vogel sat alone in the conference room. The door opened, and Ameth came in. You sent for me, sir? Sit down, Ameth. Let's talk a while. Ameth sat down uneasily. We're considering you for promotion, Vogel said, silencing the little man's protest with a deprecating wave. But we've got to know if you're ready. Let's talk about your job. Ameth relaxed. They talked shop for a few moments. Then Vogel opened a folder, took out his watch. Very good, he said. Now let's check your initiative potential. As Ameth stiffened, Vogel reassured him, Relax, it's a routine association test. For the next ten minutes, he timed Ameth's responses with a stopwatch. Most of the words were familiar shop words, and most of the responses were standard. Job. Escape, Ameth said instantly. Blueprint. Create. Noise. Hate. Want. Home. It was all so childish, so obvious, and Ameth's eyes were frightened amber pools when Vogel dismissed him. No matter. Let him suspect. Vogel studied the reaction results with grim amusement. Outside, the shop roared, and Ameth's travelers sped the rounds. Issue material. Shear to size. Form on break. Weld for print. Miter. Drill inspect, stock. One by one the strange details were being formed, finished, to lie inert in the stockroom, to await final assembly. Assembly. Of what? Tonight was project completion. Midnight. Vogel stood in the darkness, leaning against the wall. He was tired. He had maintained this visual for three hours. His right leg was numb, and he started to shift positions, then froze as he heard footsteps. Three aisles over, a light exploded, blindingly. He held his breath. From inside, in fabrication, came the muffled clang of drill presses and power brake, and the sounds of the night shift. He waited. Three aisles over, something moved. Someone fumbled in the stock bins, collecting shaped pieces of metal grunting with the effort of piling them on a salvage bench, now panting with impatience while assembling the parts. There was a hammering, a fitting together, a flash of light, a hum of power, and finally a sob of relief. Vogel's hand slipped into his pocket and grasped the gun. He moved silently. Ameth stood at the salvage bench, adjusting studs and connecting terminals, Vogel stared at the final assembly. It was a helmet, a large, silvery helmet, connected with a nightmarish maze of wiring, mounted on a rectangular plastic base. It hummed, although there was no visible source of power. Ameth put on the helmet with a feverish haste. Vogel chuckled. Ameth stood motionless. Then, when his hand darted toward the stand, Vogel said sharply, don't. Ameth stared at the gun. Take it off. Vogel's voice was iron. Ameth slowly took off the helmet. His eyes were golden with tears. Please, he said. Mars or Venus, Vogel said. Which? N neither. You could not grasp the concept. Let me go, please. Where? Vogel prodded. Another dimension? You would call it that, the alien whispered. Hope brightened in his face. You want something? Wealth? 
Power? It was the way he said the words, like the white trader offering his aborigine captors glass beads to set him free. Vogel nodded toward the circuit. That hookup. You trap the gravitational field directly? Cosmic rays? Your planet's magnetic force lines. Look, I'll leave you the schematic diagram. It's simple, really. You can use it to transmute. He babbled on with a heartbreaking eagerness, and Vogel listened. In my own world, said Ameth brokenly, I'm a moron, a criminal moron. Once, out of a childish malice, I destroyed beauty, one of the singing crystals. He shuddered. I was punished. They sent me here, to the snake pit. Sentence for felony. This, he indicated the helmet, would have fused three seconds after I used it. So, incidentally, would this entire shop. I had no time to construct a feedback dispersion. Tell me about your world, Vogel said. Ameth told him. Vogel's breath hissed softly between his teeth. All his life, a uniform vision had tormented him, driven him toward perfection. Apparently the vision was reality. He smiled, moved forward. You should have told me. Ameth saw the intent in his eyes and started to beg. Vogel clipped him behind the ear. He put the helmet on gingerly. The electrodes tingled against his temple, and his grin was wry as he thought of Alice. Then he depressed the stud. Vogel sobbed. Color blinded him. Rainbows blared in sweet, sparkling thunder. He whimpered, covered his eyes. The music drowned him in a fugue of weeping delight. Slowly, he raised his head. He stood ankle-deep in gold crystals that stretched out forever in a splendid sea of flame. The crystals sang softly, achingly, to the silver sun in the emerald sky. A grove of blue-needled trees tingled in ecstasy on his left. And beyond those trees, a city sang. White spires formed skyward in impossible cataracts of glory. A glissando of joy burned his eardrum and he could not face that living splendor. It was a city beyond dreams, beyond legend, a city where all dreams end. He strode toward it raptly. The crystals screamed, the blue-needled forest lashed wildly, and terror shivered through the air in a shrieking dissonance. From the blue forest people ran, beautiful people with great golden eyes and scarlet tunics, they had been Ameth's brothers and sisters. They stared, horror and revulsion twisting their faces. They started toward him. Vogel understood. If destroying beauty on this world was a crime, then killing ugliness must be a duty. On this world, he was ugly. End of Felony by James O. Causey